Hello, here on the Least Significant Byte channel we, um, well I, like to cover things that aren't covered very well on the internet already, or perhaps not even at all, and indeed many of the ideas I get for doing videos are when I'm doing a project myself and I go looking for information and I can't find anything about what it is, so I think I should make a video about it. So today we're back on my Commodore 128 and we're trying to solve the problem of its bad video output. And I'm going to show you two products, neither of which are on general sale, um, certainly not for the Commodore 128, although I think it'd be really good if they were. Um, something to note about the video though is that I'm making it all after I finish the work because things got really messy uh, while I was doing it and I just couldn't shoot everything and I thought I was going to mess something up, muck it about with a camera and so on. So a lot of the pictures you see are taken after the event or they show something happened before or after other parts and, and basically what I'm saying is the continuity is all messed up which is why the picture on my screen now is the finished article and not the uh, rubbish thing to start with. So without any more ado, we'll have a look at the Copper Dragon video enhancer board for the Commodore 128 and the uh, RGB to HDMI converter. The best standard video output signal from a Commodore 64 or 128 is what we now call S-Video or separated video. This separates the luma and chroma, that's the brightness and colour, and should give a fairly good image. In Europe, it's common to take the Commodore 8-pin DIN audio video connector and feed it to a SCART plug with a resistor on the chroma line. We can then connect the SCART to one of these SCART to HDMI converters that everyone seems to have, and normally these seem to work okay on things like my BBC and my ZX81. But if you've seen my video where I convert my Commodore 128 from a French to a UK version, then you'll know that the video output on it really isn't very good. So the text was very blurry, the colours were unclear, the border had these stripes of different colours going through it, the sync also kept coming and going and the converter box kept putting up this annoying status message on the screen. I also tried another one of the converters of the same type but got the same result. I wondered if it was the resistor in the cable. That's there because the voltage level on the chroma is too high for the S video as it was set before that became a standard. So I made up another cable without one. Now this gave much better colours, I mean you can actually now see the red, but everything was still pretty blurry and there was a lot of colour fringing on the text. I also tried Composite, which gave a similar image to the S-Video cable without the resistors. It had a less readable blue, but at least those stripes in the border had gone. And finally, I recently bought a Frame Meister for something else, so I thought I'd try that. This is considered one of the best analogue to digital converters and upscalers. With an S-Video Mini DIN cable, that gave a much better picture, but still the colours were quite blurry. So, after all that, I wondered if this was as good as it got, but it didn't seem right. I mean, there's loads of videos of Commodore 64s on the web, and their pictures always seem okay. I mean, there's Robin on 8-Bit Show and Tell. He has Commodore 64s on there all the time, and he seems to be using one of these cheap converters like I was trying, and his picture seems okay. I mean... Maybe that's because he's got an NTSC signal and they convert better onto modern displays. So I started to wonder if there was something actually wrong with my Commodore 128, so I thought I'd better have a look inside. So I opened the case up, moved the power supply out of the way and had a nose around the video circuitry area near the VIC-2E chip. The first thing I tried was changing the MOS 8701 clock generator for the VIC-2E for a modern TOLB module, in case it was at fault. TOLB being an imaginative acronym for the other little board. This was easy to try and reversible, I just had to desolder the chip, put in a socket and then plug in the TOLB, and if it didn't work I could always put the 8701 back in the new socket. No difference, no better, no worse. I also tried a replacement 8566 VIC-2E chip, put that in, made absolutely no difference, same as before, and then out of desperation I tried one of these Lumafix 128s which is supposed to improve the image by getting rid of the stripes and I thought maybe that would help with the colours, and it did get rid of some of the stripes on the display, um, but it didn't actually help with the colours or the fuzziness, so I was going to leave it in because I thought it looked better without the uh, stripes, but then the little pots on the top of it turned out to get in the way of the power supply and the 128 DCR from going back in, so I had to take this board out as well, so I was at a bit of a loose end at this point. Now, the Commodore 128 also has a second video chip not found in the 64, the VDC. This outputs 16 colour RGBI, that's red, green, blue plus intensity, through a 9-pin CGA connector. Using an RGB to HDMI, which is a Raspberry Pi Zero with a special RGB sampling hat, I get a pin-sharp picture with all the colours. If you've never seen one of these before, they really are fantastic. Let's have a look at how it works. Normal analogue video to HDMI converters have no knowledge of the source signal. They just sample at their own resolution, probably that of the output display. 
This means that the pixels in the output image don't line up with those in the analog source image and things can be scaled unevenly. And an analog image isn't perfect, the edges of shapes are typically blurry. Plus, they don't know what the colours in the image should be, so the pixel edges can have graded colours and noise in the image will be shown because the converter doesn't know what's signal and what's noise. And finally, because they're usually designed for real world images, they typically then apply a filter over the image just to smooth out the edges and blur out the noise, which works well on real world video, but not on pixelated computer displays. The RGB to HDMI, on the other hand, is configured to know the exact resolution of the source image and samples the colour at a point around the centre of each pixel. There's an auto calibration process to determine this point. This means that the blurry edges don't matter because that point determines the colour of the entire pixel area. And it also knows the colours must be one of a particular set for that computer and can map them to the nearest one, removing any noise. It then uses this information to recreate a pixel and colour perfect digital version of the source image. And finally, because it knows the resolution of the output display, it can ensure the pixels in the source image are integer scaled to a consistent number of output pixels, so everything is scaled evenly. And it does all this with extremely low latency, just 3.6 milliseconds or about a fifth of a frame. So what I really wanted was a solution for the 40 column VIC output that I already had for the 80 column VDC output so I could do stuff with sprites and play games. The RGB to HDMI started out as a project for the BBC Micro, but thanks to the amazing work of Ian Bradbury, it now supports a pile of different computers. There is a mode for the Commodore 64, but this first needs a computer to be modified to output component video using a Copper Dragon video enhancer board. OK, so the Copper Dragon Video Enhancer Board works by sampling the signals directly off the VIC-2 chip, and it passes those into a CPLD to create a perfect component video signal, and similar to the RGB to HDMI, it generates a signal from scratch rather than just converting the analogue one, so it filters out all the noise. The problem though is that the Copper Dragon Board was only available for the Commodore 64. The 128 has a VIC-2E, which has extra pins, and the main board has a different layout, so the enhancer doesn't fit. Now, fortunately, there are enough people interested that Copper Dragon designed a 128 version. Now, although he doesn't have a 128 himself, he just uploaded the PCB design to GitHub for someone else to have made. I managed to buy one of these off someone who'd had a few made up and had some spare. Right, so the first thing you have to do is remove the VIC-2E and then fit in this daughter board, then replace the chip back in the socket on the new board. This then feeds the sampled signals off through this ribbon cable to the CPLD board. If you have a 128DCR rather than a 128 or a 128D, there's a capacitor obstructing the daughter board, so a bit of surgery is required. I desoldered it and then soldered on some short wires so it could be moved out of the way. Once that was done, you move on to the CPLD board. The first thing you have to do is remove the TVRF modulator. This is pretty much useless nowadays, so I didn't mind losing that. To get it out, aside from the eight connector pins, there are four large blobs of solder that secure it to the board to support the mechanical force of the connecting and disconnecting of the cable. My desoldering station came in really handy here. You then need to solder on the CPLD board. This also needs to provide mechanical support for the new 3.5mm TRRS connector for the component output. OK, now assuming you haven't mucked something up, you should be ready to go now. The output for the component comes out through a 3.5mm TRRS socket that uses the same hole that the RCA connector for the TV output used to use. So you'll need one of these little breakout cables that take that and turn it into the three RCA sockets that you need for component. Um, so what I'm going to do is connect it to this cable here that um, feeds the D-terminal input on my frame meister, but you could just as easily use a normal component input on a TV or some other sort of converter. OK, so immediately I get a great picture. The text is sharp and there's no bleeding of the colours. If I was being really critical, there's a tiny bit of noise showing on the background and the image being analogue is still not quite as razor sharp as we're used to on digital video these days. But I would certainly be happy with this and if I'd got it straight off the bat from my 128, I probably wouldn't have messed about any further. But let's go for the big tamale and see if we can get it to work with the RGB to HDMI. The RGB to HDMI hardware consists of a Raspberry Pi Zero and the RGB to HDMI board itself. That has a connector underneath which you can plug in a cable for the required input type. For example, for the VDC output on a 128 I can connect a short cable with an IDC connector on one end and a D sub 9 pin on the other. For sampling analog sources though you need the special analog board. This plugs into the same connector as well as another connector a little bit further along. 
and once assembled the two boards are fitted onto the header of the pie, taking care to line up the pins as an off by one can be fatal. OK, so uh, once you've reassembled everything, aside from the USB power input and the mini HDMI um, video output cable, you'll need to make up a special cable which has an IDC connector on one end that plugs into the um, analog board video input on the RGB to HDMI and a TRS cable that can go straight into the video output socket on the back of the Copper Dragon board. And there's one final hardware thing. You need to enable a special palette that uses more distinct colours to help the RGB to HDMI detect the differences between them. On firmware 2.7 you can enable this by putting a jumper over pins 9 and 10 of the JTAG connector and then moving the output mode selector switch to the position nearest the video DIN connector. This mode replaces the one that would give visible scan lines but that's not needed as the RGB to HDMI has a separate option for that. If you're using older firmware there's a short basic program you can type in to reprogram the Copper Dragon palette and save it. To configure the RGB to HDMI we first have to update the CPLD with the YUV firmware. This just takes a few seconds and then it reboots. Once it's back up we then need to go into the menu and select the profile. That's the type of computer that's attached. And select Commodore 64 mode. The RGB to HDMI automatically detects the 50Hz PAL screen. Exiting out of the menu we have a stunningly clear picture which looks perfect until you notice that the red and blue both come out as black. That's easy to sort out though, we just need to lower voltage threshold C in the sampling menu. Back out to the main menu, a quick save and we're done. Now that image is probably about as good as it gets, it's so crisp it looks like an emulator. If you really do like the scan lines for that classic look you can turn those on in preferences or by holding down the menu button as a shortcut. Personally I prefer not to have them, the solid version is what I remember, even if my memory is faulty, same as it doesn't remember really blurry colours and RF noise. Ok now one thing the Copper Dragon board and the RGB to HDMI don't do is handle audio, but you can still get audio from the DIN connector on the back, so you can get a cable such as this that has a DIN plug on one end and the RCA jacks on the other, and you can feed your sound system completely separately through these. If you want to get the sound out of the HDMI connector you'll need some sort of device that can combine the video from the RGB to HDMI with the uh, audio that comes through this, which is something that my Framemeister will do, so that's what I'm going to use for the captures you see later. Now everything's working we need to tidy things up and put them back together. This metal cover used to go over the video circuitry for the VDC and the VIC 2E to provide RF shielding and a heatsink. It won't now go over the VIC 2 because of the daughter board, so I cut my cover in half so it just goes over the VDC side. I then used a heatsink meant for an M2 SSD which nicely covers the VIC 2 and keeps the temperature down to about 35 degrees C instead of 45 without it. You also need to be careful how you position this because of the power supply tray on the 128 DCR. That fits over the top. And the same goes for the IDC connector into the CPLD board. The tray only just fits in there. If you're wondering what the back panel looks like after all this, here you are. You don't need to cut out any extra holes. The component uses the RF output one and the video mode selector switch replaces the modulator channel one. The old audio video DIN is also still there and works just as it did before, even if very badly in my case. OK, so I think that's everything. So I'll shrink myself down now and then I'll close by letting you watch uh, Iridium load up. Uh, it's a dodgy cracked version with all sorts of intro screens, but I'll give you an idea of the image quality and the text. Uh, now one thing that doesn't have come across very well here is the um, smoothness of the scrolling. Um, because my 128 is a 50 hertz PAL model and I've recorded all the rest of this video stupidly at 60 hertz. Um, that means that all the frame rates don't match, so when you see the scrolling on the screen, to me it looks beautifully smooth, there's no juddering or tearing, but on the video capture it looks a bit jerky, but believe me it's absolutely fantastic. So I think that's everything, um, so all there is is say thanks for watching and I hope you found that interesting and as usual maybe even useful. Thanks very much, see you next time.
Yeah. <laughs>